Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, book of Matthew, chapter 25. We're going to pick it up here in verse 35 in a moment. Christ is completing the Sermon on the Mount. He has given us instructions of exactly how this earth is going to consummate the age, that is to say, the end, in that 24th chapter. And here he began this 25th chapter, which we're in, with the ten virgins. Only five of them made it because they had the Elion, which comes from El Yah, which in, in Hebrew, or in Greek rather, is the sacred name of God from the olive tree. That's why it's called the oil of our people. It isn't the oil that heals us when we anoint with it, but that is the foundation in a sense, of one's belief in Messiah, which means the anointed one. And what does the oil symbolize in the lamps? Well, what does a lamp do? It, it gives light. So how, how do you, as a virgin for Christ, spiritually speaking, cast light forth? You've got to have oil in your lamp. And that oil is truth, truth from God's Word. And you gain that truth by understanding the letter he has written to you to know and understand the seven events, which are the seven trumps, seven seals, seven vials that consummate the end of this age. It basically simplifies it for us if we listen and let the, let the Sermon on the Mount be absorbed into your mind with understanding. So we've come to this point now where he says... Um, the, um, the Lord is going to gather people in, the nations, and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are going to go on his right hand and the goats on the left. You want to always be on the right because usually anything that begins to go left, they want to drive God out of the vocabulary. That's not healthy that is flirting with destroying your eternal life, your soul to be there. It's not going to make it if you're not real careful. So uh, then he begins to explain that um, who, how you inherit blessings that were prepared before the foundations of this world. Well, God's elect earned it then. Some others can now if they believe. So having said that, chapter 25, verse 35, let's go with it. For I was unhungered, this Christ speaking, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Verse 36, naked, that's skimply clothed, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Uh, how, how did we do this? Christ saying, you did all these things to me. This, this is the righteous. Okay. Verse 37, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink. When did we do this? Verse 38. When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked, scarcely clothed, and clothed thee? 39. Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? Question. You know what he answered? Verse 40. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. You know, a lot of people, especially beggarly, 
Uh, people, do not let them take advantage of you over this. What, what is it that um, when, when one is, um, is hungry, what do you feed them with? The Word of God. We're not talking about a fish. And we're not talking about a loaf of bread. We're talking about the Word of God. If somebody is hungry, and you want to give them something that will give them eternal life, really show compassion, you give them the truth. That is to say, the Word of God. And somebody that's scarcely clothed, what do you do for them? A person without the gospel armor on and in place in this last generation is helpless. They're uninformed, not prepared, and absolutely are, as far as Satan's fiery darts, when he comes as false messiah, they haven't got a prayer without the truth in their forehead, without the mind. So you clothe them with the gospel armor when you see one, and one of God's elect will do that as best they can. They plant those seeds. Um, and, and, and a stranger, you, you are given, if somebody asks you a question, I don't care if they are a stranger, you're going to plant that seed and hope that that seed grows. You leave that in God's hands. If it does, fine. If it doesn't, hey, better luck next time. But this is what he's talking about. This is why you have to have the oil in your lamp. You cannot shine forth that light, which he is the bright light, but you are a reflection from that when you have that oil in your lamp. That is to say, the truth in your forehead to be able to clothe, to feed, to get acquainted with the stranger, with the truth, to help them and the, the very lost themselves. Uh, and thirsty, what do you really give them to drink? You give them the living water. That is to say, Christ says, I am the living water, and so he is. So that's what he's talking about here. It's not, um, and, and you share that. You can't help but share it when you have that truth. There's enough to go around for everyone that will believe. So let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, wrong side, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You do not want to go there. You know, naturally, if you're going to, if you're going to snuggle up to, to the false Christ, and if you're going to leave the true Christ and His Word, and with, if your lamp is empty of oil, you've got no truth, you've got to go into town to try to buy oil from who? Well, guess. And when you come back, the door is shut. You're not going in because you had commerce with uh, the false one. In other words, you were taken in. Thank God we have the millennium. It would be very difficult to see majorities saved without the millennium. What a time that's going to be. But you are, if you want to flirt with the devil, that's where you're going to be on that side of the Gulf. Verse 42, and, and it reads, For I was in hunger, and you gave me no meat. You didn't give me the meat of the Word of God. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. You did not give me the living water, the very truth, to those little ones. 43, I was a stranger, and you took me not in, naked, scarcely dressed, and you clothed me not. You didn't even share with me the gospel armor. Sick, and in prison, in prison to the ways of this world, you can be so bound up in false teaching that you are actually a captive of, of false religion unless you free yourself in the freedom that only God Himself through the Son can give us through the living water, through the bread of life, through the gospel armor, and the teachings and truth of Almighty God with your own or the oil of your lamp running over in your reservoir with plenty to spare to share with those that are, are, are heavy burdened uh, to give a lift 
to give a word of encouragement. And uh, that, so you want to visit him because when you do, him, when you do those that are hungry for truth, you're, you're entertaining Christ himself is what he's saying. 44, then shall they also answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered? or a thirst, or, or a stranger, or naked, scarcely clothed, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee. When, when did this take place? 45, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. In other words, um, God expects you to share the seeds of truth. And, and that's what it's talking about. Verse 46 to complete the chapter. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into e life eternal. You know, it, it is so simple to be pleasing to Almighty God. All you have to do is follow His instructions. It, um, it behooves one that knows the truth to share it. They can't hold it in. They, they have to plant those seeds. If anything, they're guilty of maybe planting too many seeds at one time. <clears throat> Excuse me, overloading somebody's donkey and driving them away. You don't want to do that. But at the same time, what a precious vessel it is that you carry with you that you have all these things that you can share with others speaking spiritually to change lives. And, and uh, how precious it is. By that, you step into eternal life. If anyone abuses you, they're, they're, they, they do not understand the trouble that they bring upon themselves. For our Heavenly Father looks out for His little ones. And when one of them is abused, look out, there will be trouble following. God is able to take care of His own. But at the same time, He does not want you to take that lamp that you have plenty of oil to survive and put it under a bushel. That means to hide it. So you share it with whomever the opportunity prevails and God lets you know when that's correct and when it is time and how precious it is to be a light giver to the world to those that will listen, the, those that would wish to be clothed with the gospel armor. To do what? To stand against the fiery darts of Satan. He's coming first, and people need to be forearmed, forewarned and forearmed to handle that situation. Chapter 36, verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, verse 2, you know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And um, we know that in First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 6, that Christ became our Passover on that day. And what he's, he's giving them the information here, I will be crucified. This is not making them feel real good. They, they love him. And, um, and it's difficult that they understand that He will resurrect, that in so doing He defeats death, which is to say the devil. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, verse 3 to continue. Then assembled together the chief priest, uh-oh, here's trouble, and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the place of the high priest who was called uh, Caiaphas, uh, Caiaphas rather. And Caiaphas means depression, and it's depressing to even hear his name, Caiaphas. Verse, he, he, was, he was not the head priest appointed by God, but by a Roman governor. Verse 4, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety, that's guile, and kill him. Now here he has healed, and here he has um, people paralyzed 
had them pick up their pallets and walk. He has kill, uh, cured leprosy, just boom. He's let the blind see. These are all remarkable, wonderful miracles performed at the hand of God. And these churches wanted to, to destroy him. <clears throat> and there's nothing new in that. If you're teaching the real truth, if you're teaching God doesn't send out beggars, there are people in the religious communities that will try to, de to destroy you. That's, that's no biggie. That's all right. Christ always takes care of his own. But here uh, you have this group that are planning to, I mean, literally kill him. And, and certainly um, that lets you know the evilness that is in this world and the fact that the, the message God delivers in this, because through this, he paid that price that brings salvation for your sins when you repent. Um, this was written that it would come to pass in Psalms 2.2, 2, the why do the heathen raise, rage, and so forth, and they do. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 5. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people, because the people loved him. The majority did. They followed him. They had been fed in the wilderness. <clears throat> they had witnessed the healings. And, you know, they would have let this pass. But God has other plans. This was the time. This was the sacrificial lamb for this particular Passover. And God was going to bring it to pass to show you who's in control. These wicked priests were not in control. God is in control. Why? Because he loves his children. He loves you. And he wanted that salvation put in place. So he himself, Emmanuel, God with us, prepared it. And, uh, and so it was. Man was going to let it slide. Let's see what, how our Father handles it. Verse 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany, that's the house of dates, in the house of Simon the leper, uh, 7, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, uh, and poured it on his head. Not his feet this time. This time it's his head as he sat at meat, uh, at, at first being on his feet. But here, here only Judas at the first uh, objected. Why? He carried the money bag. Look how many object this time. Verse 8. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? Verse 9, for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, why would Christ agree to this? She's anointing him for his burial. Verse 10, when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? Question. For she hath wrought a good work upon me. Verse 11. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. Verse 12. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verse 13, listen carefully. Verily, I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done. He told, for a, be to, it shall be told for a memorial uh, of her. And so it is. <clears throat> in other words, Look into the real truth of the matter. 
by her anointing this one for his burial, it's the greatest gift the poor have ever had in, in this world. It, they have freedom and release and blessings because he paid that price even for them. God is not a respecter of persons, poor, poor, and poorest, and rich, rich, and richest. There's no, no respecter of persons. He paid that price so that anyone that would believe upon him should not perish, but would have eternal life. And though the disciples, after all the teaching uh, that, and disciplining that he had done with them, did not see the value in this or recognize what would be in the future of this, that she was anointing him preparing for the greatest gift the poor have ever had in this world, even to this day. Verse 14, and people do remember her for that. You know, uh, you might say, well, uh, why wouldn't they do it as they did bury him? Are you kidding? The Kenites had crucified him, nailed him to a cross. And, and so it was. Um, there was no time for anointing. She took care of it. God bless her. Verse 14. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot um, went unto the chief priest. Iscariot in, is Karoth. It means a city builder. Why, why would this Judas, the money carrier, be called a city builder? And then you might remember back in Genesis chapter 4, uh, verse... Um, Oh, what, along about 17, somewhere along there, um, Cain was to be a builder of cities, his offspring was. Well, that makes you kind of wonder, doesn't it? But don't judge Judas. He did repent. He did love the Lord. He just thought that the Lord would not allow this to happen, that's to say the crucifixion, and he would have the money, uh, in as much as he was the banker, he would be the world banker because the kingdom would come in and he would be the banker thereof. Verse 15, And he said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. Um, and do you understand the prophecy that is being fulfilled there. It basically nails down this Sermon on the Mount. You see, it was written long ago exactly how this would go down and what even what that 30 pieces of silver would be used for. And again, I want to reemphasize, don't judge Judas. He did repent. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 18, you find that not that he just hanged himself. He was cut open from his Adam's apple to below his navel until all of his insides fell out. He had a lot of help hanging himself and dying that day. Why? Because the Kenites were not going to let him walk around and tell this story after he had repented. And that's why you will find uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 18, reading as it does. Um, this, this was arranged way back in Zechariah chapter 11, beginning with verse 7. That's Zechariah in the Old Testament. You won't have it. I'm going to read it to you. And it, and it reads, And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. Th this happens to be the poor of the flock is... Um, it's really sheep traffickers in the Hebrew language. That's what the manuscripts say, you sheep traffickers. And I took unto me two staves, the one I call beauty and the other I call bands, and I fed the flock. God always does feed that flock. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed, loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Verse 9, then said I, I will not feed you that 
that um, that dieth, let it die, and that that is cut off, let it be cut off, and let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. Destroy one another if you must. Okay. But here we go with the instructions. This is this is it. Ten. And I took my staff, even beauty. This is to say Christ. And I cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant which I had made with all the people. That's the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Verse 11, and it was broken in that day. You want to know when Judah and Israel separated? This is it. And so the poor of the flock, that's the sheep traffickers that waited upon me, knew that it was the word of the Lord. They knew it. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. That happened to be the price of a slave. Okay, But this was naturally re referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. 13, and the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was praised at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And that's exactly where they went. They purchased the potter's field outside the potter's gate where all the broken pottery is, is thrown, but also the burial of the poor that have no family and nobody cares about. And within this comes the fact that your body can be broken, your spirit, your soul. And when you turn to him, he can put it all back together. He can do that. And, and so it is. Verse four, that's why his blood, money, purchased the price that you can be put back together. In other words, you have forgiveness because he paid that price. 14. Then I cast asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And there you have it. That's when the separation came for the house of Israel and the house of Judah, speaking thereof. What happens then that this would relate to the Sermon on the Mount? I don't know. Let's find out. 15. And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. That's the Antichrist. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off. Neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. When you saw me, you fed me. When I thirsted, you, you gave me water. Here, this one that's coming, this Antichrist, is not going to do any of that. He's going to take advantage of you. And here you can begin to see the warnings given in 24 concerning the appearance of the false one and how it goes down. He doesn't care about you. Verse 17, Woe to the idle shepherd, the Antichrist, that leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm. And that sword is the voice of the living God. And upon his right eye, his arm shall be clean dried up. He will have no more power. And his right eye shall be utterly darkened. He will have no way to see or to deceive people when he's cast into the pit. So that 30 pieces of silver bought a lot and, and um, foretold of long ago in nailing the scriptures together so that we can have perfect understanding of God's plan that began from the, before the foundations of this earth age. Our Father knows exactly what He's doing and exactly what it is He wishes of you. So many questions are answered in this Sermon on the Mount when it relates back to the foundation thereof. Returning then to 26 in the, uh, Matthew in the next verse, please. Verse 16. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. That is to, to betray the Lord and Savior. 17. 
Now, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And this is really the Passover supper before the real Passover day. Okay, that's why, that's why many people call it the Last Supper, and you have all these plaques of the twelve disciples. Uh, and it is not the Passover meal; it's the la it's the supper before. It's it's always given on the 14th, and at the end of that day comes the 15th, which is to say Passover, the Passover. Note how this happens. 18, and he said, "Go into the city to such a man." And say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. In other words, it was all arranged. I want you to take comfort from that to know that God has everything arranged. That's why you can put faith in his word. It's going to happen exactly as he declares it's going to. There's no ifs, ands, or maybes, no risk, no chance. When you go by his word, by the true light, with your oil filled, you can put total faith in the word of God that it's prearranged for those that obey, not otherwise, those that obey. Verse 19, And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Again, it, it was all set. How, how precious our Father is. Verse 20, Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And here, what happens when the evening comes? You go from the 14th to the 15th. And, and um, the 15th, of course, is the day, the first day after the spring equinox that Passover begins every year on the solar calendar. It does not miss. And so it is that that picture that you many have hanging on their wall was taking place just as that Passover day would begin, that is to say, in the evening of that day. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We are not going to judge someone. You see, our Father is the judge, and he does not wish our help in that. Not at this time especially. You do have the right for spiritual discernment to discern whether you're hearing truth or fiction. And he sent you a letter. That's what the Word of God is. That if someone gives you information that you can't document or they cannot document in God's Word, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. You might be listening to a false teacher or prophet. So that, that can be very hurtful. But you have a gift from God, spiritual discernment, that protects you from that when you will dare use it. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world every day, it's good to hear from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. 
you got a prayer request, we can do away with the number in the address, why God knows what you're thinking. Right now, He does. He created you different, as you hear me say often, from anyone else. Your DNA is different. Your fingerprints are different. You're unique. He wanted someone just like you, but He does want you to love Him. Hosea 6.6, 6, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your grace. That's to say mercy, your love. That's why He created you for His pleasure. So let Him know that you love Him. Won't you do that? It pays great dividends. When you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. Let's go to His throne. Father, around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Cecilia from Illinois. I don't understand sometimes why I think so much and have fear of so many things. Do you think it is con a control issue? I'm now fearing aging, but I'm grateful to be here. Uh, please pray for me. Well, we're, we will pray for you, but get tough, okay? You know, to worry is to doubt every promise of God. He's with you. He knows you. and. Uh, to be anxious is not going to add one day to your life, not even one second. If anything, it's going to take time away from your life. Um, it, is, it is a terrible thing to be a servant of the living God who made all things, created all things, and gave you the wisdom to know how to protect yourself. You don't have anything to worry about. I want, I want to give you a scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, and I want, you to, I want you to memorize it. It'll give you great strength, but mainly talk to Him and stay in His Word. You've got nothing to fear but fear itself, okay? Because you're a daughter of the living God. You've got nothing to fear. Waste of time. Daniel from Texas. Since all souls must be born of woman, do you think that as soon as a sign one day, do you think as a sign one day, the number of births in the world will be reduced dramatically? Uh, it, it is written once in the um, Apocrypha that it is as the, as a woman when she's older gives weaker births, the children offspring are weaker. Uh, I do not hold to that at all, but there will be a final time. There will be no flesh in the millennium, and everyone must pass through this earth age. But even in that moment of transition, those souls that may be still in the womb, uh, I feel and always have felt, and this is not scripture, it's just simply my opinion as a student of God's Word, there are some people that are too good for this flesh age, and God gives them kind of a free pass, one way or the other, all right? But there will be an end of birth at that time. At the seventh trump, we are all changed into spirit, our spiritual bodies. Evelyn from Michigan. First, I want to say that I am glad that the Lord sent me to you to me. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Let me get to your question. Uh, I've learned so much. Thank you. The Word will do that. Uh, how do I know if I'm one of God's elect? Uh, please explain. And um, so uh, when you're on a fixed income, if you have no income, a tenth of zero is zero, okay? But um, when, when you know that the Antichrist comes first, and you're going to make a stand against him, you most likely are one of God's elect. You have a destiny and a purpose, and it's fantastic. Okay, this would be Joan from Massachusetts. Um, in the first earth age, were we in spirit bodies and were we here on earth? Explain a little bit. We, we were in spiritual bodies, but... Um, even spirit bodies, angels, as you would call them in this earth age, they, their food is what? Book of Psalms, angels' food is manna, and manna sustains these flesh bodies. Why? We were made in the exact image that you were in the spiritual body. 
and there was mass to the spiritual body in a different dimension than we're in, but uh, they, they were spirit. That's why after, before the catabol, you will find no human remains. I repeat, human remains. Uh, and uh, Satan appears on a pale horse, death, Christ on a white horse. What is the significance of this? Uh, please explain. Well, I'm going to have to correct you just a little bit. <clears throat> Satan does not appear on a pale horse. Christ appears on a white horse, but Satan appears on a white horse also. Looks just, I, I mean, probably the horses will look exactly alike. But as you would read, where do you document that? Well, it's Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. The pale horse is only the death that Satan brings through the deception as that particular stage of his ministry when he comes as Antichrist, all right, <clears throat> through the four horsemen. But you can, you can document that in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, okay? Don't, don't remember that. White horse, white horse. In other words, what God is telling you is going to look very much like the same appearance as Christ will make. Only he comes at the sixth trump, Christ doesn't come until the seventh. Uh, uh, Frenchy from Alabama, I think that's what that name is. Pastor Murray, th uh, thank the Lord for you and Dennis well, and your staff. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. I was in the dark until I began listening to your teaching. My question is, what are the names of the churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia? Well, well, that is their name. Do you mean what they signify? Smyrna is the fig plant, okay, a fig. And you have to know the good fig from the bad fig. That's, that, that would be in Revelation 2, 9, the church of Smyrna. Uh, if you don't know the bad figs, then you don't know as as Smyrna does, those that claim to be of our brother Judah and are lying or in order of the synagogue of Satan. And of course, Philadelphia <coughs> means um, uh, the church of brotherly love. And, and it is for the house of Israel, but it is the message that is important. Doesn't matter what name it goes by. <coughs> Necessarily, I'm speaking of modern time. It's what they teach. The only two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, Christ was pleased with. The others had drawbacks. So naturally, if you're a Christian, you want to know what Smyrna and Philadelphia taught. And both of them taught that you have to know those who are the sons of Cain, but claim to be of our brother Judah, and are of the synagogue of Satan. If you, don't, if you don't know and understand the Kenites, you're in a heap of hurt in these end times. And then naturally in uh, the Church of Philadelphia, in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse along about 10, you got the key of David. That's the word of God. The birth of David, the offspring, Christ. It unlocks doors that nobody can close on you and it closes doors that nobody can open. Puts you in charge, okay? Okay, this would be Barbara from Mississippi. What will it be like after the thousand years? Well, um, it, you can read of it in Revelation chapter 21. There's no more tears, there's no more pain, there's no more hurt, and this earth is rejuvenated into its original form. How can we get a temple built in five months since Satan's time is shortened? <clears throat> it's a many, many, many membered body. It's not a building, it's people that have the truth. That's the temple. And what point will the Lord make the, the world new as it was before? Again, you need to read Revelation 21. It says there is a new earth. It's, the word in the Greek is rejuvenated. This same earth will all... God made an eternal covenant in Ezekiel chapter 16 with Yerushalayim. That's, that's where his home will be forever, and uh, right here on good old earth. Carol from Alabama. 
Will paradise be on earth during the millennium because heaven is wherever God is? And I thought only Jesus and his teachers and those who have not overcome would be on earth during the millennium and for and the full Godhead with the rest of the overcomers will be on <coughs> earth after the millennium was over for judgment in eternity. Well, you're, you're pretty well right. But Christ, when he is on earth, is God with us. <coughs> and what does it mean that heaven is closed for that thousand year period? It's very simple. Because you either make the first resurrection that is to say, while you're in a flesh body, you gain the first resurrection and you are with the Father or the Son. It doesn't matter, whatever your duties are. But nobody can overcome and proceed to heaven uh, uh, during the millennium if they fail the first resurrection until the second resurrection comes on, as it's written in Revelation chapter 20. And if you don't make that one, you're going into the lake of fire. So that's why heaven is closed as far as overcoming is concerned until Satan is released a little short season. Why? To see whether those that didn't make the first resurrection can cut it. They're going to be tempted uh, probably even a little more because they're being spiritual bodies. But they should know better, just as you were in a spirit body if you're one of God's elect in the first earth age and had full recount, so will you in that age. I hope that didn't confuse, but be that as it may. Varen from California. When we die, will we still have all of our knowledge? You will most likely have a great deal more knowledge. In these flesh bodies, we have about 10% of um, what we are capable of knowing and having, is my opinion. Uh, and in, in a spiritual body, we know everything. There's, you won't have to ask your neighbor, does he know the Lord? What will be taught then in the millennium if everybody knows everything? Discipline, that's what is lacking. <clears throat> Mike from Indiana and Marsha. If someone attacks your family and you defend your family and someone gets killed, would that be considered murder? Thank you and God bless you. you have been we've been studying with you for 14 years. Well, thank you. It's good to have you with us. Uh, when you say, if someone attacks your family, that puts it in the mode of self-defense. And God approves of self-defense. If, some, if somebody is taken out uh, while, while they're trying to damage or harming your family, you're doing what God intended you to do, is to protect your own. And so it, the answer is no, it would not be murder. Murder is the word, let's take it in the Greek, okay? We could take, we'll take it in the Hebrew, it's the same. But let's take it in the Greek because that's the word Christ said. He said, you have heard it is you would be in danger if you kill. Well, the word is not kill, it's murder. And it's fonyance in the Greek, and it means criminal homicide. So uh, if you commit a criminal homicide, when it comes to your main trial, which is in heaven, you're in a heap of hurt. But to protect your family is, is normal, should be. Sherry from Oklahoma, uh, where would you study in the Bible for the seven seals? Revelation chapter 6. Okay. And, and uh, you will have the seals, all of them there, basically, and uh, it's good to know them. They're comforting and wonderful to to study, especially the fifth seal at this time. The fifth seal tells you the false Christ is coming first and what you should do about it. We're in that sixth seal at this time. Carol from Alabama, will God rejuvenate the earth after his final day of judgment, the great white throne of judgment? Yes, he will. That's, that's about the third time Revelation 21 has been brought up, uh, unbeknownst to them, in today's lecture. And again, I will emphasize, when you read the English translation, it states, you have a new earth, and that's incorrect. You have a rejuvenated earth. 
God puts this earth back in its original form. The firmament goes back where the firmament belongs and um, everything is, is back as it was originally. There is a reason that we find mammoths with buttercups in their mouth in the tundra all the way up in Alaska where buttercups don't grow there. And, uh, but it, it's, it's perfect there. Or as you've seen documentaries that we have made in, in New Mexico where you have palm trees petrified on hilltops in the desert. There are no palm trees growing in the desert now, but those petrified ones grew there before the earth, uh, the, the Cutabo uh, took place. It was perfect everywhere is what I'm saying in the original, the first earth age. Chase from North Carolina. I like all your TV, like all of your TV viewers, I appreciate your forward teaching style and have been a, an avid listener. Well, thank you, appreciate that. Please clarify my misunderstanding that an evil is caused by, all evil is caused by Satan and his minions, not by God. Uh, and you mention a certain pastor, I'm not going to say anything about that. That concept is clearly stated. I'm not sure what your comments would be. And, and you quote Isaiah 45, 7, I form the light, I create darkness, I make peace and create evil. Is uh, I, the Lord, do all these things. Do yourself a big favor and take that word evil Go back into your Strong's Concordance and see what the Hebrew word actually is. It's not evil. It's tumult. If you deserve tumult, God will bring tumult upon you. Okay, and and boy, would can He do that big time? Um, you want to be real careful of allowing someone to say God brings evil or trouble. He said, I don't even want you to say. I bring a burden. And you can read in Jeremiah chapter 23. If you wake up in the morning and say, I wonder what burden God's going to put on us today, you better saddle your mule and get ready to ride because you're going to get your donkey overloaded big time. God doesn't appreciate it. And he lets you know that if you, if you look up and accuse him of bringing burdens, He's going to burden you all right. It'll be probably the last time you'll ever do it. Uh, a wise person would never go there. God does not bring evil. God does not bring burdens. He do God does correct when one needs it. Marion from Washington, is it okay to sell my wedding ring to help a family member who is sick if my husband has passed away? Uh, you know, Hun, this is something totally you should decide for yourself. Uh, there, there would be no sin in it if that's what you're thinking. It would be perfectly all right, and it shows that you have a great deal of compassion. And if it would help somebody that was dire and sick, then uh, God bless you if you do that. But um, I, I cannot tell you. You have to make your own mind up on that because it was your wedding ring. But I can understand why you would not need it any longer because you're sealed there anyway. David from Florida, thanks so much for your welcome. I don't know any church in my area that teaches the word. I do have a question. Why do you refer to Satan as being physically in heaven? I thought every entity in heaven is in the spirit. Please explain. Thanks and may God bless you all. Uh, you, do, you do not understand that a spiritual, spiritual body has mass? It does. Uh, it's only in a different dimension. Flesh and blood cannot enter heaven. Why? Because it's a whole different dimension. Example, when Christ resurrected, he came through the door, but when he left, he did not go through the door. He went through the wall. So which was not there, Christ or the wall? Both were there, but he was in a different dimension. So um, 
hopefully that will help you. Satan's evil spirit can traverse this earth now as God's Holy Spirit can. But his physical body will be cast out to this earth when he comes as the Antichrist. And it will be in a dimension that we can quite well see. Uh, Anna from, um, from, uh, where is Anna from? Anna is from, my name is Anna, I'm, se I'm 78 years old. I was Christian born and I've been a believer all my life for 40 years. And whenever, when you are very young and you sin, not knowing any better, it is a forgivable sin. I don't want you to pressure my sister, all right? You, Thank the Father for forgiveness and go in peace. Uh, Stanley from Alabama, question, why do the two witnesses have to die in the streets of Jerusalem? Um, been with you about three years, age 57. Well, it's good to have you with us. The two witnesses, uh, they've never died. Elijah, I know many say Moses died. God would not let man bury Moses, and even Satan in the book of Jude looks for the bones of Moses. He can't find them. Uh, so I have to assume, in as much as Moses showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration, that they have to die once, okay? And they will in the streets of Jerusalem, but it's to document the true Christ's arrival, for they will resurrect at his appearance. And I am out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. That's good, but you know what's most important? God loves you for it. It's the letter He sent to you. And when you study the letter He sent to you, He makes your day because you make His day. It really makes Him happy. Let Him know you love Him, won't you? We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we have helped you and only if we've helped you. You help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? You bless God, He will always bless you. Most important though, listen to me good, you stay in His Word every day. And His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is a living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.